Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming um, to our Symbi seminar. Um, it gives me great pleasure today to welcome Professor Rachel O'Reilly um, from the University of Birmingham. Um, she studied at Cambridge before then uh, moving on to do a PhD at Imperial and then spending some time in the US um, before coming back to Cambridge um, and then moving to uh, Warwick where she was then um, became a full professor um, and then earlier this year in January she's um, just moved to the University of Birmingham. Um, she's a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry um, and has won awards such as the Gibson Fawcett Award and was also named one of their 175 cases of um, faces of chemistry. Um, so thank you very much, Rachel, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to come and tell you about some of the work that we've been doing in, in my group over the last few years. I think this is the first UK seminar I've ever given. I've given, that's I have to say, I'm from the University of Birmingham. My instinct is uni University of Warwick, so I'm from the University of Birmingham. Yeah. We, we are, the group has yet to move, I have moved, so we're a bit in limbo, so it's a pleasure to be here. One of the things I wanted to just highlight, so my group is a polymer synthesis group, and I wanted to highlight this quote from um, uh, Nato, who won the Nobel Prize in 1963, that if you think about how we might characterise our age, if we look to the past, maybe, maybe we should be talking about the age of plastics. If you think about how ubiquitous plastics are um, in the world around us, it's maybe not unreasonable to that. That's how we should classify as the material that is the thing we perhaps use most and, and rely on actually most. But one of the things that I always am amazed by is that polymers and plastics are actually a 20th century concept. So the, the discovery of small monomers linked together by covalent bonds was um, discovered by Hermann Staudinger and actually when he proposed this theory that it, that, that it was covalent linkages in monomers rather than known covalent aggregations of colloidal assemblies, he actually was thrown out of, um, uh, I think it was ETH in Zurich and they said they completely did, did not agree, he was ridiculed in the literature and it turned out to be completely correct and won the Nobel Prize. But he, it was a very controversial a discovery to say that you could put monomer units together into long chained materials. Even though there were lots of um, biopolymers out there, they were all considered to be um, colloidal assemblies. So, just I thought I would um, kind of quantify that by charting the history of polymers to try and give you a context of how new some of the materials that we actually, whilst they not, might not be desperately exciting in some ways, they're actually um, relatively new. Um, so if you look back to the Bakelite and the first polyvinyl chloride, one, really the first synthetic um, polymer and um, made on um, uh, mass uh, commodity scale. And there's hopefully some interesting facts here that basically it was after the end of World War II that like nylon and other um, uh, poly, uh, materials started to become prevalent. They were developed um, to, to aid in war efforts and then they became prevalent in society following the developments um, uh, for, the, so for the war effort. And an interesting, I think an interesting fact is that actually polymers overtook steel as the um, most used material per volume um, in 1989, which is, as I said, not recent enough ago, but actually really hopefully highlights the explosion of polymers. And there's been the Geological, a geological Society um, indicated quite recently that actually polymers and plastics should be used as a geological marker because of the, 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 their quick appearance and now sudden prevalence in, 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 in the environment, which is obviously not, not always a good thing. But plastics age, everything, every, you know, everywhere around plastics are ubiquitous in everything we do, from our cars to our phones to all kinds of packaging. But uh, to get put in some sort of context, actually 360 million tonnes were produced in 2015, but actually almost, and almost all the, half of all the plastics ever made have been made in the last decade. So we're just this explosion of materials, yeah? And actually, polymers are super easy to make, so where are the challenges in polymers? And this is where um, we've been looking for the last couple of years, and there's a couple of things that I think are quite important. You can make all these polymers on vast scales, and they have function, but actually what might be some of the challenges and areas of interest to look at, and what, what are we trying to do? So we're quite interested in both stereochemistry and sequence, how we actually put monomers together, um, and that should hopefully give to, lead to some added value and maybe some sort of enhanced or different function, and then also sustainability. sustainability. What monomers do we put together and what might the long-term um, impact of them be? And those three topics are kind of the little three um, areas we'll tell you about today. So just to try and hammer on the example of the concept, if you look to nature, they make stereo um, chemically pure, sequence, perfect polymers, proteins, DNA, etc. Um, and the sustainability, they're the, the life cycle of um, 
um, monomer production, um, polymerization, degradation, etc., means that actually it has created machinery in and um, a life cycle that makes it really sustainable. And we don't do that. So we are really millions of years behind nature as polymer scientists. If you think the, the it's just taken um, proteins as the example, a very small monomer library um, uh, of defined stereochemistry in can. Um, into a controlled primary sequence, you then get controlled secondary tertiary structures and advanced function. Whilst we have a much, we, much larger library of monomers, we actually can do a lot less with them. Yeah, Putting them together in a tractable sequence defined manner is really, really difficult. So we often end up with random conformations. So if we want this polymer to be functional, we actually put chemistry on that uh, polymer to make it functional rather than use the chemistry um, embedded within multiple monomer units, except for example, in folding to create um, catalytically active sites, etc. And the concept of sequence is important, but actually the concept of stereochemistry is even more important. So this is where I'd like to start. So if you think these are just some examples of how just simply the change between the R and S and antimer in, 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 in molecules leads to really different properties. Oranges and lemons, R and S lim 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 lim, um, are give us very different properties. <laughs> Um, same as spearmint pyroisides, and then again, biological, it's known um, certainly that um, uh, uh, the biological effect of small molecules can be quite different depending on the stereochemistry. So this, these, chemically these are the same, they have all the same elements in the same ratio in the same compound, but actually just this, the, 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 where one or more of those atoms are in space drastically changes the biological effect. And we often don't think about that from a polymer perspective. There are some examples, of course, nature thinks of it um, and uses it. If you think of just DNA and the um, circumstance of DNA, it leads to structure and then um, the double helix and, and, and then uh, subsequent function. There's one good example in polymers, which is isoprene, which is natural rubber, which if you look at this trans isomer and is sorry, the cis isomer, which is elastic, good aperture, which is chemically exactly the same. It's now just the uh, one four isomer is really very brittle. So again, chemically exa exactly the same, different arrangement of atoms in space leads to very different material properties. And we've been interested in that and been working hence for the last couple of years in um, a polymer called polylactide. It's also interesting because it's a renewable um, polymer. But if you take um, a lactide monomer, which is just this dilactic acid, you can either have the L or D isomer. And if you take the, so for example, the L um, lactide monomer, you can polymerize, you form poly L lactide, PLLA, and it actually forms a helix helical structure. If you take the D isomer, you can polymerize it and you form a helix of the opposite um, uh, handedness. If you just take a mixture of L and D together, you actually just form a random coil. Yeah? So um, through current, and this is known through stereochemical control of the polymer, you can actually change the, the folding um, and conformation of the polymers. But what we actually use is these helical polymers actually are semi-crystalline and we're quite interested in using that semi-crystallinity to direct assembly. So just to give you an example, just to give, show you how that affects the assembly of these molecules, this is a, a, a molecule we use quite a lot. It's got a, a, a group that controls a radical polymerization and a group that will control a ring opening polymerization. So it's just a difunctional small molecule. We ring open lactide, either the L or the D, and then we do a second polymerization through this group and we make essentially an amphiphile. So this is a, it's got a large hydrophilic portion, a very small hydrophobic portion. Yeah. In that hydrophobic portion, one polymer has the L isomer, the other has the D, the other is the other is um, uh, racemic. Yeah. If we take this polymer and assemble it, they actually form very different structures. So by electron microscopy, we can see that the isotactic PLLA forms cylinders, whereas the raplactide forms spheres. And we would expect spheres based on conventional self-assembly packing parameter principles that you would use for surfactants or other lithophiles. We take we move out of that. Um, predictive regime and in today's regime where we make anisotropic um, structures and these um, worm-like structures. And we can confirm the reason why we get these um, uh, cylinders is actually because of crystallization of the core and we do that using just um, wide angle x-ray scattering. But this is chemically the same. This, this is the range of whether we have a, either a random coil or a, a helix leads us to forming a different hierarchical assembly. And how, but how might we use that? Why is that interesting? Well, one of the things we can now start to do is take the same polymers chemically um, and actually start to make 
libraries, and this is just a, this is just a couple of um, uh, polymers, where we can make spheres and cylinders of maybe different lengths, and you can imagine using different morphologies, and start to look at how their biological activity might vary based on the different shape of the construct. Because nature doesn't work with spheres, it has it uses anisotropic structures, but accessing single phase and uh, non-spherical constructs using polymer self assemblies is very difficult. This crystallization approach allows us to. So we were interested, we take this, as I said, the collaboration we have with the uh, uh, Gerson in Fudan, where we, we took some of our um, spheres and cylinders, which had a polycholic acid corona, put on a manos to try and look at actually their immunological function. So we had a sphere of 50, uh, we also a cylinder of 100, and a cylinder of 200. We also had a cylinder of 50, um, but I haven't included that on the slide just precisely today. But the thing that we noted was that these chemically are the same, but actually the different shape of the particles actually affected the inflammatory response. So we were seeing a different inflammatory based on the shape. And one of the, there are a number of papers out there suggesting that the shape of nanoparticles has an influence on their cell uptake, their inflammatory response, but there are very few systems where chemically the same polymers are used so you can actually make direct comparisons between the different morphologies. And we're now starting to be able to do that using stereochemistry to direct self-assembly. So we can start to make libraries of these, of these types of, of products. So it starts to help us understand what sort of delivery uh, vehicle we might want to make by being able to scope out a, a space, and um, not just size, but also space. But one of the neat things with um, polylactate is actually if you take the L and D isomer, which I said are opposite helixes, if you actually co-assemble them, you form a stereo complex. And stereo complexes are very interesting. A PLLA stereo complex actually has very similar material properties to polystyrene, so it could be an excellent biorenewable um, alternative to polystyrene. But we were quite interested from an assembly perspective if we took D and L together, mix them together either as pre-assembled cylinders are just as polymers, what, what might we form? And indeed, we actually see some uh, kind of unexpected in a way, um, results in that if we just take the helical L and D polymers and assemble them, we have to use elevated temperature to ensure we get a good unit of exchange, we can form, we just form a sort of stereo complex seed. And these are really, really stable assemblies. They are really robust. We've really challenged them in a number of environments. And that stereo complexation is a really strong driving force to hold them together, which is really important if you're thinking about them potentially from a delivery application. We can again see very different characteristic signals in wax, which show that we have this stereo complexation occurring. But what we actually were really quite interested in is could you imagine having um, two cylinders with potentially two different actives in them, if we mix them together over time, if they, if they were able to reorganize and reassemble into, say, a spherical construct, we'd be able to get a triggered release. And rather than having a, a, a delivery vehicle where you have a particle that then goes to a polymer that then dissipates, we would then still have um, a, a, a defined particle in our system. And this works, it actually works it's slow, which um, some, some of the work that we're now starting to do this in, in a more biologically relevant context actually means it's probably quite a good thing. We can get quite a slow release of two different components, which then can then trigger um, a much faster cascade. But just with some of this, with these initial results, we can see that actually we can use a lot of small angle X-ray scattering, TIR and wax, to be able to show that we can change from these um, isotactic um, systems through to the stereo complex. And again, chemically, we're not changing a single bond, we're not, we're not, we're not chemically changing these at all, we're just simply changing how these um, polymers are organised and in space and come together to provide actually quite different function. And we can do this, we can make these worms very long and have gels that then fall apart and form spheres, so we can actually start to play about with my, this morphology transition to change bulk material properties, which normally you have to actually change bonds and chemistry to do that. So that's some of what we've been interested in from the point of view of serochemistry. Sequence is one of the other things we've been interested in for quite a while. And there's been an explosion of sequence controlled polymers and lots of very nice papers on how to do that. But actually, the, the, what, what polymer scientists are really good at, we can make statistical, we can make blocks and periodic. But actually, it really cannot make sequence defined polymers of, of that I would say are of a length of greater than about 10. And then you, there, you, you will not, I don't think, get emergent material properties until you really start to be able to get to long polymer materials. And the polymer mechanisms and, uh, that we use do not allow for this. 
But why might we want to? Well, actually, it's, there's a, a quite a nice paper by um, a group in Reading and Strasbourg that talked about um, just simple AB block of polymers and based on the Shannon and information content, if you just had an AB block of polymer encoded with an A and B as well, zeros and ones, if you had a DP of 10, with 20 to 100, in theory, you could, uh, you could um, uh, uh, store 10 to the nine terabytes of information. You have no way to read it. This is the problem. And this is where there's, there's a, a whole emerging field in polymer science of how do you read sequences. But the principle of you actually don't need very complex sequences to be able to make and um, uh, to be able to potentially store um, information. The other thing that we're perhaps more interested in is thinking about if we can make sequence contrived materials, maybe they will actually fold rather than just have random coils. Will we be able to get emergent function by having by uh, by getting and um, the sort of controlled folding, which then should hopefully lead to precision hierarchical assembly and um, more advanced function. But we need to learn to how do we explore and um, sequence space more effectively. So we just think of current approach. If you think at one end we've got um, proteins, perfect sequence precision. Um, the other end, plastic bags, easy. You can make lots of them, but actually they really don't have a lot of, uh, they, don't really, they don't have sequence specificity. So at this end, where we're looking at um, uh, very complex um, precision materials, they're often done with this single, this multi-step, stepwise synthesis. They can be rather arduous synthetically, quite wasteful, multiple, um, and they really are limited to ligamers. So okay, you can make 50 mers, you really can't, a lot of the, some of the polymers we make in my lab through conventional polymerization methods have DPA thousands, and that's not unusual. Yeah, We're, these are working on it by virtue of their mechanism of working in a much um, shorter regime. If you think of the polymeric approaches, where you either have selective monomer insertion or uh, a reactivity approach, which we worked on. You can make long, but you really don't get precise. You get control sequence, but you don't get precision sequence. And you get a distribution of molecular weights, you get a distribution of sequence. So actually it's quite hard, I think, to um, really be able to extract um, uh, uh, sequence information and so structure um, activity relationships between sequence and function. But if we think about how nature makes proteins, uh, the, the, it's significantly more complex than how a polymer scientist makes their um, polymers. As I said, you have you have to templation, you have coding, you have protection, deprotection, you have you have a, a complex machinery that allows you to do this. And actually, as as uh, polymer scientists, we don't use that generally. But if you think about and take inspiration from confinement and synthesis, if you think about how chemists make something, we take A and B together, we put them in a flask in millimolar concentrations, you get one product. If you think about how nature does something, it has lots of products. And it uses either templation or confinement to bring the product, the molecules together at once to, in a, uh, to allow for selective reactivity. So it doesn't use protection and deprotection routes, it uses confinement. And that's local um, uh, con high concentration allows for efficient chem chemistries. And as I said, we were, when we started this program, I was trying to work it out, maybe close to 10 years ago, with Andrew and um, Turkmen's group, where we were quite interested in thinking of how we could um, look at some DNA templated chemistries to access sequence control materials. And David Liu in Harvard is very much a pioneer in this area, and has shown really nicely that, as I said, if you take an oligonucleotide with a link on a reactive group, you can use hybridization reactions to either bring things to the end of helix or um, across a NIC architecture, allow to bring two reactive groups into close proximity and allow them to react. Now, to show that very simply, if you imagine you have two reactive groups and two DNA strands, complementary strands, you form duplex formation, you bring your reactive groups into very high local concentration, you can hopefully do a transfer reaction, form a product, and you can keep doing that and build up your oligomer. It's obviously not that simple. One of the first things we did was actually um, looking at this um, forming this um, uh, strand exchange mechanism. And one of the key things we had to look at was trying to get the identical reaction conditions in each step so we would be able to reach um, relatively long um, oligomers. So the principle of this is that we have um, two DNA strands, the black and grey are complementary and then distinct toehole regions. We mix them together, hybridise, we then bring A and B into close local um, proximity, high concentration, they can react, we can do transfer, and then we can essentially add a complementary strand fully to, this, to the waste strand and do a, do a strand exchange mechanism, form a waste duplex and then leave our reactive single strand dimer and then add a new monomer or new um, DNA strand and then the reaction can continue. And this worked well, I'm not going to tell you, we used bitted chemistries, it actually worked very well. We were able to optimise to be able to make 12 mers, so we were able to make relatively long materials. 
and we have this alternating um, annealing and um, um, transfer chemistries. One of the difficulties we actually have is, if this is still actually doing it in a chemistry way, in that we're still adding, we're adding, chem, we're adding the reactive groups at each step. It'd be much more elegant to be able to have all the reactive groups in one pot and then add potentially instructions. And that was the, the next um, mechanism that Andrew's group um, uh, developed for us to be able to use, was this mechanism which we term junctions. We're now changing around the, the, the complementary and distinct regions. So now we have um, much larger unique domains and much smaller universal domains here. And if you imagine we start with um, all these adapters in solution, you can add in an instruction that says, please bring red and green together. That brings our two of our four adapters together into close proximity. And we form this junction, which allows us to do our transfer reaction. Then we can essentially wipe that instruction with a fully complementary strand to our instruction strand and then add in a new instruction. And you can imagine how with a pot of lots of different adapters, you actually add in instructions to selectively bring things together you want to in sequence. And to prove that this actually might work, one of the um, uh, um, proof of concept experiments we did was when we take four different DNA strands, one with FAM, TAM and ATO, three of them sort of coloured, one just labelled yellow here without a dye, and then looked at in one pot, and the important thing is we're not purifying in each step, we're, we want to be able to, to add an instruction and wipe an instruction without purification, yeah, so we're doing it all um, in, uh, through sequential instruction addition without purification. So we looked at seeing whether we could do this just simply through a page experiment and just to walk you through, so one to four are the initial strands, so the FAM, um, yeah, the FAM, TAM and, and ATO, you can't see the yellow box and dye on it, but five is this, so you can template all the four adapters together, so you see a mixture of them all, you can't really see the green one unfortunately, but then when we add in the N6, we add in T1, which is template one, which says please bring blue and, and red together, which means purple, so you can see now our purple band, and you can see the green has been left behind. We can wipe that instruction and then add a new instruction, T2, which says bring blue and green together, you can see the blue and green brand and the red left behind. So we can, and then we took this right through, been able to make it um, form these junctions and then wipe the instructions. Been able to do that in one pot meant that actually we can start to con use instructions to control the sequence of reactions rather than using the addition of the reactive groups. And this allowed us to actually do even, even more by, by playing about with the mechanism and looking at either a, a same an alternating or, or a same strand mechanism, we actually could start to look at adding two different instructions in one pot, making two things in parallel and then linking them together. So one of the things that is um, um, limiting, I guess, in uh, some of the early mechanisms we were thinking about is every step, so we have, if we want to make 100 more, we'd have to do 100 steps. If we can start to do this where we're in parallel, we can make um, oligomers and then join them together, we're now making in three steps a six mark. So it's starting to get a little bit more efficient. It's still far from, from um, uh, uh, natural systems, but it's starting to become more efficient. So if we think about from that, what next? Well, we can, the things we can do, as I said, and the, the mechanisms that had, would allow us to do a number of things, but actually, really, we're still having to add instructions. So is there a way to do, from a, from the point of view, an autonomous system, and that then might allow us to do more from the point of view of um, um, amplification and look at the sequence and select, etc.? So, as I said, the, the thing to think about with those to use a molecular machine, we start thinking about a coded track. And this is work that I think Richard Muscat and Andrew's group um, developed a, a HDR type uh, uh, mechanism to be able to try and do this directional mo motion as, as termed the molecular assembler. And this is very much inspired for, by this work um, from um, uh, Niels Pierce on this HCR reaction. And as a polymer scientist, this is amazing. You have Basically, you store potential energy in the loops. You have an initiator strand that kicks off and starts the process. So you imagine you have two stable, a um, mixture of two stable um, hairpins. You have an initiator that, um, that opens the first, sorry, that opens the, 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 um, the, the one of these um, hairpins. And then essentially, you then, as you open that hairpin, you expose um, the, in this case, the green um, uh, DNA strand. Um, and then the complementary hairpin to hold, but then can hybridize. And this reaction allows for an autonomous growth and production of this um, duplex. So essentially you have an initiator that kicks off your polymerization, 
and then you have potential energy stored in your hairpins to allow you to get this um, growth of uh, a duplex. And thinking about could we use that in from the point of view of polymerization? Our polymerization reactions aren't actually that different. We kick off with an initiator and then we do propagation steps. The key thing that you realize is that we have to do a propagate. We can't just do a propagation cycle. We have to have an instruction that, that lets us know what, what is the next monomer that needs to be added. So we need to do an instruction and then a reaction step. And then we should be able to potentially make, use this type of HDR reaction to make um, sequence defined um, materials. So if we think about what the components are, we have an initiator and a cargo strand. The cargo is where the oligomer will grow. We have instructions that essentially say, in this case, go from, so from initiator to A, or go from A to B, and this is what basically initiates and also recruits, decides what um, forms what the next chemistry strand to be added is. So there's one of these I to A strands and then lots of these other instruction strands. And this choice of these instructions defines a sequence. We've then chemistry strands, which have these little blobs on here, which are the chemistries that we're going to try and add on to our cargo. And whatever these um, A's and B groups are, are what basically defines the oligomer chemistry. So if you imagine at the start, you have all these things in solution. And if you look, the, the, the colours represent complementary um, uh, regions of DNA. So if we have all these mixtures in solution, the only two things... The only two things that will um, react or come together, hybridize, is this initiator cargo complex and our first initiator to a, um, a, a hairpin. Everything else just sits there. If this happens, they come together, they can, my basic animation, they come together and they form it is, a holiday junction, which then basically opens and leads to um, an opening and exposure of this hairpin. And now we have this exposed, this reactive hairpin. And now there's a comp in the in solution there is this the, the RA um, uh, strand that has that has a, a complementary region. So that the, the molecular assembler having opened that loop is saying, please add A, a next. A um, is then recruited. Again, you form a holiday junction, you get hybridization, and during this hybridization holiday junction um, and migration, you're bringing the two reactive groups into close proximity allowing them hopefully to react and if they react we should get a, hopefully a group transfer should happen and then this migration continues and this, this is um should happen concurrently during this migration and we have again now exposed another hairpin or a light blue hairpin which is says go from a to b so again we recruit this they just flip to the other way around, so it's on that space. Again, same thing happens again. This continues, so we have this cycle of hybridization loop opening recruitment. And this cycle um, uh, opens a loop and then instructs the next thing to add to an instruction and then uh, uh, addition of chemistry. And that allows us to then build up this mechanism. So if we think we have these cycles of hybridization loop opening and recruitment, one cycle essentially is the instruction cycle, the next cycle is a group transfer. So we have to do this twice be able to get on um, uh, 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 add a monomer unit. So it's quite complicated, but it works. Um, so if you think, if you have instructions I to A, A to B, B to C, we just form A to C. If we then add another instruction of A to C, you can imagine then we could actually make up an oligomer of A, B, C. So we could program this to actually program what um, sequence um, material we wanted to make and should in theory be able to do it in an autonomous way. There were some tests that we did again, just with some um, labelled um, uh, strands using page. Hopefully you can just see here, so we have all the different components of our assembler. We've, um, rather than having chemistry on our A and B strands, we've got FAM and TAMRA. Um, and if you look, as I said, when we put everything together, but don't have um, uh, any instructions, you can see in lane three, nothing happens. Once we have everything together and have instructions in lane five, we can see we brought and our, our HDR reaction has worked, we've got the red and green together and now form this um, uh, lower mobility band. We can also test it from the point of view of whether we can actually get multiple steps to occur. If we think, if we label the cargo with FAM and then the, all the chemistry ones are non-fluorescent, so we're basically just looking at the, the, the cargo getting longer and longer, hopefully as it adds more and more chemistry strands. It's really faint, apologies, can't we see it? Or is it a band that Grades to higher and higher as we add more and more instructions and actually if we add um, 14 or 15 different instructions and 14 monomers you actually can see we can start to form a ladder of products so we can actually do this and, and be able to build up some of these um, oligomers. There's 
some of the oligomers that we were able to make. They are relatively small oligomers and bremers, etc. But as I said, and I should say, we only make pickamoles, so they're characterised by mass spec. So that's certainly one of the limitations. But actually, um, we can we, the chemistry can vary. We use Wittig, we use amidation chemistries. But this is where it kind of hit. It's, it really is challenging. The reality is the chemistry isn't actually isn't isn't as good as the mechanism. The DNA mechanism doesn't let us down. It works perfectly. The problem is, whilst we're bringing reactive groups together, our, the, the, our, re, our, for example, in the amidation chemistries, we have active esters which aren't stable. So but the, the mechanism is going and bringing these things close together, but we've actually got hydrolysis. And this is one of the examples where if we uh, try and make a, a 14 mer where we have 15 mer sorry, where we have um, add 15 equivalents of our C monomer, so this is not a sequence, but just a, a, a poly C that we're trying to make, you can see that the majority product is actually a 4. And the highest we see is a seven. So it, we essentially run out of our monomer. Our, uh, our monomer dies, becomes unreactive by the time the machine. Uh, so um, but our, our molecular assembler runs on perfectly. The chemistry lets us down. But even even that being the case, you can do some interesting things where you can um, put in two different programs at once and in one pot make different 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 um, um, sequences. So this lends itself potentially to um, a combinatorial approach. Again, you'll see the yields are, uh, these are the yields by mass spec, they're rather low, to say the least. Um, but as I said, it does, um, it does show that it's possible. But perhaps one of the interesting things that you can do is that you can actually, if you imagine running this um, HER mechanism and, and in doing this sort of uh, polymerization to form the duplex, you can ligate. And then you can amplify it and then be able to read back the sequence. So we have a, a record of the DNA sequences on the oligomer that we've made, which is really important if we want to start thinking about and potentially taking this forward. So what, how might this contribute towards new materials discovery? So this is kind of what we, I think we can do now. There's improvements that can be made primarily from a chemistry perspective. And as I said, the DNA is fantastic. It's actually the chemistry that lets us down. But the next steps are starting to think is we need to get better chemistry. We need more, better chemistry and more optimized chemistry to allow us to actually be able to really start to challenge the DNA mechanisms, yeah? And um, can we start to think about how we can use um, uh, uh, genes as our, 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 our programs? And then that allows us to increase library size and think about selection and potential evolution. And that's something we're now talking about and thinking about, as I said, um, collaboration with um, Andrew's group and The last little bit I just want to um, talk about is actually um, sustainability. Um, this was a really interesting article, I think, in Science Advances, which basically says, where are all, I think the title of the, the paper is actually, where are all the polymers we've ever made? And it's quite terrifying that if you look at this, this, oh, this is million metric tons, prime reduction, it's been recycled, discarded, there's a fair number in active use, but actually there's a phenomenal number that just discarded, and that's not necessarily a problem. Pa plastics are low value items, we're not going to use them, but if they're going to be discarded, we need to think about how they, the, 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 the lifetime of uh, their, um, their life cycle when it comes to use versus discarded. And if all, if you break that down a little more and think about all the polymers ever made, basically polyethylene, polypropylene, all these polymers here that maintain carbon, so polyethylene, polypropylene, polyvinyl chloride, polystyrene, okay, there's um, urethanes and the esters there, but actually the majority of polymers are these main chain um, carbon polymers, which fundamentally take a long time to break down. So a really interesting, this is a really interesting paper last year at Macromolecules, where they actually challenged polymer community really to think about the, the lifetime of making, using, and degrading polymers. So if you think how, how the lifetime of your plastic bottle is days, hours, yeah, very, but the time it takes to actually make the raw materials that we use to make that bottle, even if you go for renewables, it's still maybe years, not 10, not 10 to the 4 years like it is for um, fossil fuels, but even, even if we move to renewables, we still have a problem with the, the, the plastics are very quick, very single use of materials. So one of the things we need to start to think about, we, just, we need to either think about shortening the cycle for synthesis or shortening the cycle of degradation so we can bring them back into production um, quickly. And we do a lot of work with polylactide, and I told you a little bit about it earlier, but we've done a lot of work because we're quite interested because it can be um, produced from corn and this, got, this lactide cycle is um, actually um, very efficient. And a degradation of a polylactide 
fall takes about three months compared to 450 years of polystyrene. And as I said, if you use sterile complex polylactide, the material properties are actually not dissimilar from polystyrene. Yeah? So it's a potential replacement. It's still at the minute too expensive. Nature Works in the US are trying to um, push it forward a little bit to try and um, increase uptake. Who knows? But, so you have, it's, as I said, it, this is a good example. The other thing that we've been quite interested in is we use lots of we make lots of vinyl polymers with just carbon backbones, and they are really the problem in that they don't degrade. So we've been, we, the other program we have is this polymer caprolactam, where if you do a ring opening, you form this polyester, which actually degrades, as I said, similar to polylactide over months rather than years. And we've been interested in this monomer here, this MDO type monomer, which on the pointer, and this MDO type monomer here, which has a vinyl and also these um, oxo groups, which allows when you polymerize it, you actually form a, a, a polycaprolactone like mineral. Yeah? So we're quite interested in introducing these heteroatoms into the backbone of conventional um, carbon backbone polymers. So we do a lot of CRP, controlled radical polymerizations, super easy, you can do them in bulk, our undergrads do them in the lab, but really, really easy, you can make kilograms of materials very easily in the lab, but you form this carbon backbone polymer that's not degradable. If we co-polymerize and mix in a little bit of this um, ketone acetal monomer, you actually can inter selectively introduce these um, ester linkages into the backbone. The problem is the reactivity of these two monomers is so different, it's so hard to do. So we've had to look at designing new catalysts and conditions and new monomers to try and allow us to do this. And actually, the monomer that we really hit on was polyvinyl acetate, polyvinyl alcohol, which is um, really, as, as I said, is a phenomenally useful polymer. Polyvinyl alcohol is the stuff that if, you're, if, you, if you buy fancy uh, dishwasher tablets with the, the clear plastic stuff that dissolves when you put your dishwasher capsule in, that's polyvinyl alcohol. It's, it's uh, very, uh, it's, not a, it's not necessarily a sustainable polymer, but it's actually very biocompatible. And we've done lots in this area where we've made it into particles that can degrade and we can make functional um, degradable polymers and tie them and make particles and everything. That's not what I want to tell you about today. I actually chose wanted to tell you about that. one of the things that we've been doing in the area of um, PEG alternatives. So a lot of you have probably been familiar with polyethylene glycol. It's a polymer that's often used. It's what's used to actually append to drugs. Sometimes to try and improve their um, circulation um, uh, and, and their efficacy and reduce um, their um, toxic toxicity. We were interested in actually trying to make some degradable pegs. So, and one of the interesting things with some of the PEG monomers is that actually they are thermoresponsive. So we do a lot of work in delivery and uh, controlled release, and we're interested in these polymers that change their state based on the application of a stimuli. In this case, these are all thermally responsive. So these polymers essentially go from soluble to insoluble upon increasing the temperature. And by that, when that happens in an assembled state, they either change morphology or they can lead to release of something, yeah? The difficulty is these are all the commonly used ones. They actually have, um, this is the most common one, but the monomer's got toxicity. These aren't bad, they're really hard to make and scale. So they actually have um, some chances. And some of their degradation products are pretty nasty. This is a really interesting family of polymers that was introduced. The problem is when they degrade, they form polycrylic acid, which is really quite nasty. So we were interested in making mimics of this with a view that, thinking about what the degraded, what the products upon degradation um, would be uh, of some of the materials. And we made this family of polymers that look very similar, but they're actually vinyl acetate derivatives, so a derivative of polyvinyl alcohol, and so degradation will not form polyvinyl alcohol. And if we can mix these types of polymers with some of our MDO type polymers, we can form degradable polyvinyl alcohols, degradable hydrophilic polymers for um, drug delivery. And we can do that, so we can co-polymerize. These co-polymerize very well. We've been able to match reactivity ratios. This was maybe a whole PhD's work. It's quite depressing when you put it on one slide. And um, to be able to match, to actually ensure that we had a statistical co-polymerization, so we can actually be very confident in the placement of our ester units through the polymer to allow us to get this responsible and degradable polymer. And the, I think the cool thing we can do is by just changing the amount of the two monomers, we turn the cloud points so we can have something that transitions and potentially could release at 25 degrees or something that releases at 90 degrees. So we can tune this very easily so we've got a real handle. The other thing that we were quite interested in, actually these are two polymers that have the same, would respond at the same temperature, so would release their payload at the same temperature, but they have significantly different amounts of degradable monomer in there. So we can actually start to independently tune response temperature from, from a rate of degradation, which you actually can't do 
they said, because they're often so closely interlinked, but because of the design of our system, we can actually now start to do it. And that leads, just to show you an example of this in this particular system, so the blue and red solid traces are they're pretty similar. The, the temperature response is almost identical, these two polymers, but actually one degrades twice as fast as the other. So you can imagine how you might want to be able to use this as a, a gel-like material, and you want it to undergo um, uh, this the, you don't want the temperature of transition to change, but you want it to degrade at different rates. So we've started to make um, uh, materials, multi-materials with these types of polymers to allow for selective, um, um, rather than, uh, uh, so we can actually start to get a controlled release by mixing these fast releasing materials with slower releasing materials. And these are all done with these enzymatic degradations. And actually, they're, they're, they're starting to um, look really um, promising compared to a lot of the standard degradable polymers. And one of the key things, as I said, is that actually the, the, the products of degradation are actually biocompatible and, and non cytotoxic. So they're actually much, much better than a lot of the current uh, materials that people use in their, um, their coronas, their, their particles. So hopefully, um, we're now starting to take this on a little bit more and actually do some animal um, uh, uh, work to try and confirm this um, in vivo. It just brings me to the end. I thought I'd put up a sort of a slide at the end to kind of highlight broadly the areas we work in. So as I said, there's, there's biomimetic synthesis where we're interested in DNA template chemistries. We do a lot of characterizations, we do a lot of light scattering and we do a lot of um, microscopy and development to try and understand the dynamics of the particles we form, how, uh, as I said, and how they, um, what their, their form and function, uh, their form and is following um, application of their function. We've been interested in actually how confinement affects Catalysts will be very interested in, rather than designing fancy new catalysts, thinking about putting rather boring catalysts in interesting environments to see if we can actually get advanced function through environmental control rather than just designing complex catalysts. I did that all through my PhD and had about a 10% success rate, which was quite depressing. So we're quite interested in something that's active, but trying to change its function. This nanoparticle engineering where we're starting to move away from spherical constructs and making um, plates that we can, uh, and cylinders and rods, etc., with very low um, dispersity that we can then undergo things like colloidal assembly. And one of the underpinning things that we do a lot of is we need really efficient chemistries to modify our polymers um, and be able to um, uh, introduce function and uh, modify their chemistries to allow us. It just remains me to thank um, my group. I'm really fortunate. I've got a fantastic group of people. I've put some names up at the top for some of the people who've worked in some of the various areas. Um, I should thank the ERC. They funded probably the most of this. And of course, thank Andrew and Robbie and John from um, Andrew's group, who we've worked on with all, on all of the DNA templated chemistries now for a number of years. I should thank Andrew Doug, who we work with some, on some of the polylactide work, and Gozong, who we did a lot of the, uh, the immune um, response work with. Thank you for your attention. I'd be really happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. So this is one of the things that they start this paper tries to define what they mean by sustainability. They're actually, I think it's the, the thing that's been proposed in it is it's just thinking about the life cycle. So if it if depending on the as long as you think about the the the, the time scale of degradation and whether you can recover and reuse, or what happens to the if it does degrade, what happens to the material it degrades into and on what time scale, like a, the, your polystyrene cup that you do coffee in, the fact it takes 450 years to degrade and you use it for such a short period of time, that it's starting to think, trying to think more about for high value items, falling apart may not be necessary, because if, if, as I said, if, it, if it said it's a high value, but large bulk items that are used for very short periods of time, the, the, the current proposal is starting to think about how you might be able to find either good materials alternatives that might degrade under a much more accessible time frame, is kind of where, they, and also they're just thinking generally about where we make all these polymers from, from as I said, the, the fossil fuels we use, how can we actually start to think about other feedstocks. We do some work with some um, uh, extractions from, uh, from apples to get monomers and things, and so starting to look into what other, um, what other feedstocks you might be able to use. That was the other question yeah. that you had feedstocks. Is it more sustainable to use something that's a product, mm. or is that then competing with there's been, there's been so much. This is where now. this is where a lot of the pots so of polylactide has been great promise. Probably they've been 
groups in the US have been working, doing beautiful work for the last 20 years and probably a lifetime, but it's always been it competes with food. You can't, you sh it, you sh we shouldn't, we shouldn't be, if we're making corn, it, we should be, it should be used to feed people, not make materials. And that's why there's been a very slow uptake. So you can also use, make um, uh, lactide from CO2. So there's a lot of CO2 as for, for CO2 yeah. capture. And so that's, that's, a, that's a growing area. So it's, there are, you can also actually make it from um, fossil fuels. Lots of different ways to make. So it's, it's thinking of new ways to make monomers that there has to be an added value. There's no point just making really expensive polystyrene at this point because we still have enough fossil fuels to be able to just use it. So that's why most of the research is now towards th things like poly polylactides that would have a view of longer term sustainability. But it's, it's been a very muddy field for probably the last five to ten years. But as I said, there's a, a great review on Mac Molecules kind of sets out a, almost a roadmap for um, the community to, to shape thinking. Yeah. So I was interested in what you said about um, kind of storing information mm. on this and how it's difficult to actually mm. read the information once you put it in there. Mm. What, what kind of needs to happen in order to be able to make that reality? Is that a so there's one really nice example from a group in Reading where they were able to use quite specific chemistries to do selective binding so they could then read out, and they, but they used really advanced NMR to be able to see um, basically cross-space interactions between a binding unit and it worked beautifully just for that polymer. I think one of the challenges is there isn't a, unless we have a uniform um, uh, read, reading system or, or a recognition system like DNA has with the nuclear bases, there isn't, there, there's so, we almost have far too many different chemistries that could be in the side chain. Finding a universal readout is gonna be really hard. The other thing that people have talked about is actually can we do something like uh, an Eggman degradation, be able to degra degrade, to be able to read, to break up, to be able to read. You can actually, there aren't polymer systems that will do that uh, to an end, um, scission and, and, and monomer release. And that's something that I know people are working on. We've tried a bit in our lab, but have not had a lot of success. So the, the readout, at the minute, it's all been very much adding a particular complementary binder for that polymer to then see if you can then. But that I know the group that did that in Reading, and that was years and years of NMR work to just get. And it's beautiful, but it's it's not readily translatable. And that's where actually probably a lot of the a lot of the advantages are very elegant, but they're actually not translatable. So honestly, I don't know, but I think it's yeah something people are hopefully starting to think about. So at the back to the recycling report, mm. Mm. Do you design these things to pull the parts spontaneously or bit of both. So the, the polymers I talked about, if you just have them at neutral pH, they'll last for with the longest we've had them is probably three or four years and they're fine. But actually uh, under basic pH or with uh, and they're ester in the backbone, so um, they they can they uh, enzymatically degrade very readily. So the key is putting in something in the backbone. That means they could be degraded by enzymes because the, the polystyrene is just a, the, yeah, the, 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 the time frame for degradation is so crazy. But getting ester backbones in in a controlled way is super hard because the, the, they're just they're opposite ends of the polymerization kind of mechanism. There isn't a polymerization mechanism readily that does both. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much again. Um, yeah.